Okay, after all the greetings and openings, it is time to introduce the speaker of our first key lecture. Rika Burnham is head of education at the Frick Collection and ongoing project director of teaching of uh, Teaching Institute for Museum Educators Time at School of Art Institute of Chicago. Previously, she was a museum educator at the Metropolitan Museum of Art. She lectures and conducts workshops at art museums nationwide and internationally. Mrs. Burnham, Ms. Burnham sorry, published articles and wrote uh, books such as Teaching in the Art Museum, Interpretation as Experience, which she co-authored with uh, Elliot Kaiki. Recently, she was awarded an honorary Doctorate of Fine Arts from Massachusetts College of Art and Design in 2014. We are thrilled and happy to have Rika with us today and invite her to share with us some of her knowledge and experience. Welcome, Rika. Good morning, everyone. It is a great pleasure to be here and a great pleasure to be in this truly great museum. I want to thank on behalf of all the presenters, uh, James Snyder, Tali Gavish, Beverly Penkin, my dear friend Wendy Woon, and my dear friend Tina Davis Snyder, um, the staff of the Israel Museum, the marvelous technical support people that are helping us today, and of course everyone who is joining us to discuss issues of importance to all of us as we move into the future. I'm so happy that there are so many people assembled here, 350, I'm told, and I am extremely grateful for this conference as we build together a new and wonderful international community for museum education. <clears throat> Our work in museum education is now global, thanks to the reach of the internet and the rapid rise of social media. We think of MOOCs that reach thousands, online resources that serve millions, museum educators dedicated to a macro enterprise. In contrast, the practice of sitting in a museum gallery with a museum educator and a few like-minded art lovers is a micro experience, one that in the new global context may seem more like an endangered species than a program whose survival is critical and whose function of reflective, attentive, close-looking, slow-looking, and deep-thinking conversation is, in fact, irreplaceable. Dialogue, that is, talking to, with, and about works of art, plays an essential role in bridging the gaps that lie between us, and in bridging the gaps that lie between us and the objects. In museums, we seek to bring people together with works of art in ways that are meaningful and profound. Dialogue, true dialogue, enables us to do so, that is, to push the boundaries of what we see and understand. Some of the questions that I propose we think about today are the following. What is dialogue in museum teaching? Why do we do it? Why is it hard to do? What forces work against it? What does it look like and why must we do it? So to begin with, what is dialogical teaching? Dialogue is the foundation of understanding and interpretation. It begins with a long look and an open mind. It becomes a give and take, a back and forth. Dialogue is talking about a work of art with each other and with the work of art itself. A dialogical pedagogy encourages visitors to construct meaning through a seemingly simple idea. They will bring what they know. I, the museum educator, will bring what I know. Together, we will shape an interpretation. Yet, individually, as part of the group, we will come to our own individual understandings. Maxine Green, the late great philosopher at Columbia Teachers College and thinker about aesthetic education, would have added, all we need for dialogue is our lived life. And so dialogue cultivates knowledge, beauty, and inclusivity. A dialogical pedagogy is inherently attentive, focused, questioning. A dialogical pedagogy fosters curiosity and creativity. A dialogical pedagogy includes information, 
but uses it carefully, judiciously, to follow, not to direct, the thoughts of participants. Through dialogue, we see and think together in new ways. Museum dialogues need to be transacted in a spirit of freedom in which we honor everyone's questions, what everyone brings to the artwork. When done well, we find that at the heart of every meaningful dialogical encounter with a work of art, there is a moment of truth. A mutual curiosity emerges. The museum visitor is no longer spectator, but participant. The educator is no longer the driver of the experience, but part of it. The artwork is no longer still and inert, but active and alive as we gather around it. So why is di dialogical teaching so hard to do? And what forces work against it? Historically, dialogue in museums has not been the norm. In many museums, it was long thought that visitors had to be brought to a single predetermined understanding of a work of art. Curators defined understanding, and there was widespread belief in the institutional voice. Single, one-way, interpretive monologues from on high were solidified through publications, curatorial authority, exhibitions, docent training, educator training, labels, wall texts, audio guides, all with an emphasis on getting the facts right. Educators and docents then transmitted these curatorial texts to passive museum visitors, often in short sound bites on highlights tours. This practice is what the Brazilian philosopher and so social justice activist Paulo Freire derisively called the banking system of education, in which we open the heads of our visitors and deposit information and then close their heads so the information stays there. Paulo Freire went further, saying that when this happens, there is no room for imagination, creation, participation, realization, that we erase the capacity to interact with and change the world. Educators themselves often prefer the direct deposit method, knowing they can, can control the outcome through a lecture. They fear, too, that in openness, in open dialogue, objects could perhaps mean anything, or that they themselves would not know enough to contain the infinite possibilities in a plausible realm. Sometime in the mid-20th century, we began to acknowledge that our visitors have a great deal to say about works of art, and that what they have to say is pretty interesting. It's also important and contributory to our knowledge of the objects. So our, our ideal teaching practice has shifted from the lecture to the dialogue, from the mere recitation of curatorial interpretations to including everyone in the active and ongoing interpretations of the artworks. In this newfound inclusivity, everybody is brought together to form an interpretive community, collectively realizing that the world can be a richer, deeper, and more enlightened place when we see and think together. We create new texts, new meanings. We generate new ideas. Artworks thrive in the laboratories of our minds. Years ago, when I was teaching school groups nearly every day at the Metropolitan Museum of Art, we had set for ourselves certain goals. They were these. We wanted our students to have fun, and we wanted them to come back. We also wanted them to see everything. And it took me years to realize that these were pretty low goals for a great museum. Wonderful if they should have fun, but there were great works of art in the collection to see and understand. And wonderful if they wanted to come back, but wasn't that a deferred responsibility, like snapping a photo of the Mona Lisa and then saying, I'll look at it, I'll look at it on my iPhone when I get home. And marching them from gallery to gallery did not yield inspiration, only tired feet and bored eyes. So we finally realized our work as museum educators must have higher goals. Our work is to invite people into the very process of making meaning 
of interpretation. So they will leave the museum knowing in their hearts what it is to really look at a work of art. In reframing our goals, we noted visitors were most captivated by works of art through intense looking and shared thinking. When they studied a work of art with us for an hour or thereabouts, often they would say, I never knew how to visit a museum before. I never knew that I could look at something for so long and find it more and more interesting. Sometimes other people say what I was thinking. Sometimes other people say just what I needed to know. I wish I could come back and look at everything in the museum in this way. Now I know how. John Dewey, the American philosopher and author of the great book, Art as Experience, published in 1934, became our guide as we, as we reframed our teaching practice. He described what was happening when we were in dialogue with groups. He described the intensity of the conversation that we were observing. He described it as an experience, an experience being something that is separate and distinct from everyday experience. An experience happens when you are pulled into the work of art, when time seems to stop, when you are fully absorbed, when there is nothing else besides you and the work of art. Dialogue sets this process in motion. As we experience, we interpret, and as we interpret, we experience. We search for meaning that opens up within us. Genuine dialogues by necessity must be conducted in a spirit of freedom in which we honor what everyone brings to the artwork. As educators, we create the conditions for experience. We let a work of art settle down so we can begin to see in. We stop lecturing. We stop asking questions. We privilege talking to and with the work of art and to and with each other. To repeat, the museum visitor is no longer spectator but participant. The educator is no longer the driver of the experience, but part of it. The artwork is no longer still and inert, but active and alive as we gather around it, as we ourselves come alive. So to move on to the next question, what does dialogical teaching look like without actually doing it? So I want to remind ourselves first of what it does not look like. It will sound very familiar what non-dialogical teaching is, and it will sound as if it was handed down from on high. This is a painting by Pierre Bonnard titled Large Room Overlooking the Garden, painted in 1933, purchased by Solomon Guggenheim in 1938, and has been since then in the collection of the Guggenheim Museum in New York. It was exhibited in a retrospective of Bonnard's late work at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in 2008, and today is considered one of Bonnard's masterpieces. Bonnard was born in 1867 and died in 1947. He was a founding member of the post-impressionist group of avant-garde painters known as Les Nabis. Widely considered one of the most eccentric of great 20th century painters, he did not work within traditional ideas of pictorial structure and order, but preferred to work from memory, alternating his time in studios in both the north and the south of France, and so on, and so on, <clears throat> without ever even looking, to, looking at or referring to the painting, and so on, until the painting actually seems to die on the wall before you. Until the monologue, you just heard, became a wall itself between you and the artwork. So what does dialogue look like and why must we do it? You have seen dialogue in the faces of the museum visitors that I have shown you in pictures. Absorbed, probing, thinking, seeing, chatting, reflecting. We must have dialogue for the works of art to come alive. We must have dialogue to generate thought and imagination, to generate new texts, and sometimes words bordering on poetry. By crossing into paintings through dialogue, new and beautiful worlds open to us. I'm about to share with you a project that I did at the Metropolitan Museum of Art when the Bonnard exhibition was there. 
I kept a log of the words used by participants in dialogue in an adult program that I taught repeatedly over the course of five different evenings, five different groups of people sharing their thoughts with me about the same painting for approximately an hour each time. The words I collected are condensed here, but I share them with you to give you a sense of the rich alternatives for understanding an artwork through dialogue. Follow these thoughts and observations and note how we are pulled into this picture in surprising and unpredictable ways. It doesn't take long to see the colors shimmer. Our eyes are invited to revel in the lush lavender and blue tablecloth with its hot orange edge. We see two dazzling yellow plates. We see two dazzling yellow plates with blistering edges of pinks, yellows, and oranges that contain glowing fruits. Rising off slender pedestal stands, the plates levitate and out the window, deep glorious greens frame the ebullient but nearly indistinguishable blues of water and sky. The most vibrant and subtle of complementary colors, fiery oranges and icy white-blue lavenders entrance the viewer's eye. When we discover an apple painted in the purest primaries, a red apple with a blue shadow and a yellow highlight, we smile. A blaze of pinks and yellows run up and down the left side of the painting. A lustrous vase of blue blobs over a lush green holds a bouquet of dark red roses. We think there is no story, just a place. Only then does the eye rest on a figure that has just entered the room. Upstaged by the roses teetering on the edge of the table, she appears in a dark green dress, a slender white collar shot through with red, defining her face. Was she there all the time, we ask? or we, do we just now see her slowly, quietly entering into our vision? She is mute, masculine, peering benevolently into the room, and as we look, she seems to want to slip out of the room. Dark ochre modeling gives form to a shoulder turned so she can slip past us, her hand reaching for a doorknob we don't see. She darkens and slides out of the room off the edge. Our eyes see her luminous equivalent on the left, a yellow shimmer, a ghostly glow left behind, as if another presence attends her appearance, or as if she were there a few moments earlier, leaving only traces in light. Outside, the blue water and blue sky continuously and persistently press inward into the room, bold against the fragile appearances of the figure and the shimmering form. Who is she? Where is she going? As she exits, the painting glows as if heated from within and below. We, the viewers, are left with fragments. And so we start to learn about ourselves, how we see the world, what we do with shards of memories, how we comprehend appearances and disappearances, how we accept or not the ultimate uncertainty of fact, but perhaps the certainty of our own feelings. Bonard reminds us that sight doesn't exist in the abstract. Bonard reminds us that we cannot see without memory and feeling. Figures slip in, figures slip out, like the jump of the heart, the whisper of something remembered. And so, I bring to a close this reconstituted and condensed dialogue. But I hope that in reciting this to you, that we find the painting is summoned to life, and that those words could be our words. And that these words now become the text, the new text temporarily displacing all previous texts, including the monologue that I read at the beginning. Teaching framed in these ways might well be called a dialogical crossing, where we break down the barriers of the past, the barriers of information, and the barriers of belief that separate us. 
Instead, we come together in creative acts of interpretation in which everyone is equally involved, the teacher, the museum visitors, the work of art itself. And so we construct new meanings for ourselves and for the world. The plurality of our voices reflects the pluralities of the world around us. And as we learn to see and think together, art is a means to understand ourselves, others, our communities, and our world, which are always in flux. We find life, freedom, and the possible. Thank you. Thanks.